Hello, everybody. We're back. And uh, today I'm going to actually start you off on the um, textbook. All right, so let me move over to our textbook chapter. The only reading that we have for today is uh, chapter three, part three. And I'm showing it to you here. Um, there's, a, there's some diagrams. We'll be going through these um, in more detail later on. But towards the end of the chapter, there's a nice little video uh, that you could view. Um, it pretty much covers what we're talking about in, um, in a very short, uh, brief sort of way. I think he does a really good job. And uh, to a certain extent, I'm going to be reiterating what he does in his video with our um, lecture video today. Okay, um, maybe a little more slowly, maybe more uh, comprehensively, but that's the plan anyways, all right? And so uh, in the previous lecture, we talked about how different kinds of, of uh, we call them organic functional groups, things like amino groups and phosphate groups and sulfhydryl groups, uh, carboxyl groups um, are really what make different kinds of organic molecules do what they're supposed to do. And uh, one example of that is an amino acid. In fact, I've got one ready for you to look at right here. And so uh, I guess the context that I want you to have here is that when you look at an amino group, you've got, well, you've got the carbon framework, but in particular, you've got this amino group over here. That's what makes it mean. You've got this carbox group over on the right-hand side. And uh, those are the two things that identify it as an amino acid. The rest of the molecule, the rest of the car carbon hydrogen framework can vary somewhat. And in fact, we have 20 different kinds of amino acids uh, that are all differing in many ways, except for the presence of the amino group and the carboxyl group. Okay. And, and so that's uh, kind of like one bit of context. We, we, we talked about uh, amino groups and carboxyl groups in the previous lecture because I wanted to have that information ready in your minds fresh as we started to talk about these uh, organic monomers, the, the foundations for the building up of polymers. Okay? And the general theme here is that we've got two different levels of structure. Uh, we've got uh, level one, which are the, uh, the monomers. These are the building blocks. Common metaphor that is used to describe uh, monomers, but basically we take these building blocks, we uh, use, we create new covalent bonds between the building blocks, and we end up with polymers. Okay? And so um, proteins are really large, are, are made up of polypeptides, which are long chains of amino acids. Um, complex carbohydrates like starches, like cellulose, are polysaccharides, which are basically made up of long chains of individual building blocks, which are the monosaccharides, and, uh, and DNA. DNA and RNA are both polynucleotides in structure, meaning that they're made up of long chains of individual units, the monomers, which we call mononucleotides. Okay? Lipids are a little bit different. I'll, I'll wait until the very end before, to get, before we talk about the structure of lipids. Uh, but the basic idea here, it's a very simple concept, but there are little bits of detail that you want to be able to understand. It's, it's, uh, one is that the process of building up polymers from monomers is one type of metabolic process, metabolic in a general sense. So we've got two different kinds of metabolic processes, one of which is a type of metabolism when we're building up polymers from monomers. We call that anabolism. Okay. Anabolism is a buzzword that we introduce here. And the opposite process where we take a polymer and dismantle it into monomers uh, that is the process called catabolism. Okay? So catabolic, anabolic, or the adjectives catabolism is that form of metabolism when we're breaking things down, dismantling larger polymers and creating monomers. And uh, the opposite process when we're building up uh, larger molecules, that's an anabolic process. All right. And so uh, well, we've got uh, those two different basic processes, uh, the mechanism, the, the chemical changes, the, the rearranging of the covalent bonds, the reactions, uh, are going to involve two different reactions, one of which is going to be the dehydration 
synthesis reaction that occurs with anabolic um, polymerization of monomers to create polymers. Um, dehydration synthesis, we call it dehydration synthesis because a water molecule is actually extracted. We end up with an extra water molecule. So water molecules removed, that's why it's dehydration. Synthesis means we're putting things together, okay? And um, linking monomers together to make a polymer would be a synthetic reaction. Okay? Uh, the dismantling process is going to require a water molecule to be broken. Uh, that water kind of it's kind of like the water molecule that you got out when you did the dehydration synthesis. We have to put that water molecule back. We take that water molecule, break it apart. Hydrolysis means breaking apart of a water molecule, and we uh, use the the um, covalent bonds that were broken in uh, with as we took apart the water molecule, we rearranged the bonds accordingly to make um, to make individual monomers from the uh, the polymers, right? And so that you know, we've got the basic two different kinds of metabolisms, anabolism and catabolism. The mechanism, chemical mechanism underlying anabolism is dehydration synthesis. The chemical mechanism underlying catabolism is hydrolysis. And the last bit of information is that uh, these two reactions, you know, they, they, they are different in terms of uh, whether they're gonna require energy going in or gonna, they're, gonna, they're not gonna require energy coming in. A little bit of energy comes out. Remember, in the previous lecture, we talked about how chemical reactions rearrange covalent bonds. And um, I guess the question is whether you're gonna be getting more energy back uh, than the energy you have to put in uh, in order to break the bonds are gonna get, it, more than that energy back when you create the new bonds? If so, then that would be an exergonic bond. Or do you need to put in more energy to break the bonds and you get back when you form the bonds? That would be a process that's endergonic. Remember that? And so we're saying, well, all of the dehydration synthesis reactions are going to be endergonic because the energy that are required, the energy that's required to break the covalent bonds is greater than the energy we get back by forming the covalent bonds. And, uh, and because these two things are kind of like opposites, yin and yang, right? If we require energy to create, to do this dehydration synthesis, um, it's effectively the same amount of energy that is released when we undergo hydrolysis. Okay? And so hydrolytic reactions, breaking apart of polypeptides into amino acids, breaking apart of poly saccharides into monosaccharides. Uh, these are both examples of reactions that do not require an outside energy source because they're hydrolytic and they're inherently exergonic. Okay. And so um, let, now, now we can actually do, do some um, illustration, a little bit of detail. We're, gonna, we're actually going to start here on amino acids because that's what I have on my next slide. And so uh, amino acids, individual amino acids like the one that we, we uh, had on the board. Uh, we're gonna be seeing how they come together to create larger chains. And, and if we just make a, a dipeptide, right? Two amino acids, you know, amino acid, you call that a monopeptide, just a peptide. A dipeptide would be two amino acids. It's simply just a continuation of that process to link together more and more individual amino acids to make a polypeptide. And I, I'm gonna illustrate that for you right now, right? So we'll go to the next slide here. And, uh, and, and this is actually the amino acid serine. Um, don't worry about that. But if you look at the side chain down here, okay, you know, that's the bit of the organic molecule that determines this, uh, identifies this as, as serine. Okay? And so uh, again, I wanted to draw your attention to the amino group and the carboxyl group on the right-hand side. We're going to be taking this molecule, and uh, and now we're going to be, uh, hopefully I'll be able to do this. Um, copy. Oops, didn't want to do that. Okay, now how, how am I supposed to move this if I can't see anything? Okay, so my plan was to was to copy this molecule and uh, and do a quick linkage together, but that doesn't seem to be working. 
Okay, so that works. I'm going to draw in another amino acid over here. I'll do my uh, amino group. Here's the central carbon, H. Here's my carboxyl carbon. Maybe on this one, I'll have a C, H, H, C, H, H, C, H, 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 H. All right, and 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 basically, what what uh, maybe you should you should be able to see that this is another amino acid. Okay, and and so the the crucial bit here is in this bond right there between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. Uh, this bond right here between the carbon and the oxygen, those are the two bonds that are going to break. Right? And so we're going to break those two bonds. So if I can erase them, not erasing, oops, not erase, no, I, I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, we're going to be breaking those bonds. And um, breaking that bond, breaking that bond, right? And we're gonna be forming new bonds uh, between the oxygen and the hydrogen. That's a new bond that's gonna be forming. And we'll be forming a new bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. It's, you know, I'm drawing the arrows to the right, doesn't really matter which way you draw the arrows. But in any case, the structure here, this part on the bottom is gonna obviously become an H2O. That's the part that is uh, dehydration. And we're basically putting the, the, uh, the two amino acids together with this bond right here, that's a peptide bond. Okay. And so if you have um, this reaction, basically two covalent bonds breaking, two covalent bonds forming, uh, basically the energy we're getting back by forming these two new bonds is a little bit uh, less energy, there's less energy coming back uh, than what was required to break the two bonds uh, that were uh, that were there originally. You know, the oxygen um, bonded to the carbon, the nitrogen bonded to the hydrogen. Uh, those bonds were a little bit higher energy uh, and it took more energy to break them. We're getting less energy back when we form the water and the peptide bond. And so this will be a reaction that requires energy exergonic, right? Now, um, let's see if I could do this without messing things up entirely. So if we have the peptide bond, well, we have our peptide bond. This would be like a dipeptide because we've got two of them. Um, the opposite reaction, hydrolysis, would require that there be another water molecule coming in at H2O. And now we're gonna be breaking two bonds. We'll be breaking the peptide bond. We'll be breaking uh, one of the bonds between the, um, the oxygen and the hydrogen. And uh, the two bonds that we're forming are gonna be replacing them. So let me uh, erase those bonds, erase that bond, erase that bond. And now we're going to be forming another bond between this oxygen right here. Oops, oh, that's, between this oxygen right here and the and the carboxyl group, okay, OH. It's going to go over there. And this hydrogen right here is going to be coming in to form a bond with the nitrogen, right? And so water molecule is broken. Hence hydrolysis, and we're taking the bond, taking the dipeptide, and making uh, two individual amino acids. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? Dehydration synthesis is going from uh, monomers to polymers, and hydrolysis is the opposite. We're going from a polymer to a uh, to individual monomers. And, and you could actually see, oh, the fun part about this, you're actually seeing where the water molecules are coming in and where the molecules are leaving during dehydration synthesis. Okay. Uh, the next example that we're gonna go through is glucose. Um, this is glucose. 
I'm going to draw another glucose for you right over here, glucose number two. Okay, and I don't expect you to be able to draw the molecules, but, but I, I do want it, you to, uh, to recognize that this is a molecule. It's got a lot of O's. Remember what we said? Um, O's are bonded to two things. H's are bonded to one thing. C's are bonded to four things. That's true throughout the entire molecule. And, and yeah, we'll be actually coming to points where I'm no longer gonna be able to draw all the atoms in for you, but you know, let's take baby steps, right? And so uh, when, when you look at this one, you might even be able to see the water molecule that's going to be coming out in the process of dehydration synthesis right here, right? Yeah. And so if we break this bond here, break that bond there, put, you know, put these together to form with a, a new bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen on both sides. In other words, we're taking this hydrogen and attaching it to that oxygen. And now what we're gonna be doing is creating one more covalent bond. One more covalent bond is gonna be forming between the oxygen, oops, didn't want that. It's a little on eraser mode. Another, ox, another bond between the oxygen and the carbon, and that's gonna be our, uh, we call it a glycosidic bond, but that's a, pep, that's a bond, this is a new bond. That's joining the two monosaccharides. So you know, what I've just done was to draw monosaccharides. Glucose. Two of them. Um, undergoing a dehydration synthesis reaction to create a disaccharide. In this case, it's maltose. Uh, and we're also getting a water molecule. Okay, and that's uh, how dehydration synthesis uh, continues. And if you added another glucose on over here, and another one after that, another one after that, you can see how this is going to very rapidly become a trisaccharide, a tetrasaccharide, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and until you end up with a long chain of glucoses. And maybe at that point we would just say, "Here's a glucose. Here's a glucose." Here's a glucose, here's a glucose, here's a glucose, here's a glucose, right? And if we get a, a polymer like this, a polymer of glucose, that might, that might be a, a single um, polysaccharide that would give us cellulose, right? which is a polymer of glucose, right? So um, that's uh, the basic theme. Uh, I've illustrated that now with um, individual amino acids, which get together to form uh, polypeptides, many peptides. That's the foundation for protein. This is the protein family. We'll be detailing them in the next module. Uh, we have monosaccharides, disaccharides, and uh, larger units, larger polymers. And this would be in the family of carbohydrates. And then uh, the third class that we want to focus on are mononucleotides, which are going to be forming polynucleotides uh, through the process of, of you know, polymerization. Now, 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 one thing that's a little bit different for mononucleotides, and this is you know, a very you know, you know, nitpicky point for us at this juncture in the semester, but much later in the semester, we'll be doing things in the laboratory where we, where we actually synthesize our own DNA. We, we, we actually you know, are going to be, uh, actually, if you, were, if you were in a class that's taking the laboratory, you would be isolating a sample of DNA from your cheek. Um, and, and then we would be isolating, you will be using a process called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to synthesize many copies of a chain that will eventually determine, you know, you'll be, uh, be uh, using another technique to determine whether you're one genotype or another. In other words, we're doing some real you know, kind of sophisticated lab work uh, that's going to involve us actually synthesizing DNA. 
um, in the laboratory, right? And so when we do that, we need to use not, not just mononucleotides. Obviously, if we're going to be making mononucleotides and making a polynucleotide from that, right? So I, I know we haven't talked about DNA or RNA, but all I want you to care about right now is the fact that we're going from a mono unit to a poly unit, monomer to polymer, right? And so in the case of a mononucleotide, we're going to be creating a polynucleotide. The one difference here is that we don't have to do a standard endergonic process because mononucleotides, when we use them, when we, when we uh, add mononucleotides to a PCR mixture to have it produce uh, DNA on its own, uh, with, we don't have to put any, any, any extra energy because each mononucleotide is coming with its own extra energy. It's like, it's like we're getting our building blocks pre-charged with the built-in energy that they need in order to, um, to drive the synthesis. We don't have to add any energy because each particle is, is coming in with its own little energy packet. And so in this case, we're, we're basically joining up In this case, we're basically joining up mononucleotides, uh, mononucleotides with mononucleotides, but we, but they're coming, as I said before, they're coming with their own little pre-charged, uh, you know, little energy boost on its own. So we don't need to add any energy. All we need to do is to rearrange the bonds, and that's going to require us to um, basically break the bond between the extra two phosphates and the first phosphate and create a new bond between the phosphate and the oxygen, right? And we're, also, we're going to be breaking this bond as well, right? So we're going to be forming, adding the, the hydrogen to the double phosphate that's coming off and um, joining the phosphate on without any extra energy. And the result is going to be a linking together of the mononucleotides, right? Um, This up here is mononucleotide one. This over here is mononucleotide two. And then we could basically add mononucleotide three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to six billion. And that's, uh, that's what's required in order to make uh, a mononucleotide from single, uh, a, poly a polynucleotide like DNA from mononucleotide, mononucleotide triphosphates. Okay, um, so yeah, the again, uh, what you should be taking home from this particular lecture is that, well, you've got the dehydration synthesis, you've got the hydrolysis. Dehydration synthesis is anabolic and it's also endergonic. Okay? Endergonic, meaning that it requires energy to go in. Okay, one exception being uh, when you take mononucleotide triphosphates and put them together because the mononucleotide triphosphates are kind of like they're you know, their own little you know, energetic particles. And so when you join together mononucleotide triphosphates to create a dinucleotide, that's actually an exergonic reaction, but you're also going to be getting out um, a, a diphosphate group, which is one thing that you don't get uh, in, the, um, in, in the other kinds of dehydration synthesis reactions, right? Okay, and the, other, the third thing that we want to have is that um, we're going to be associating different kinds of, of uh, monomers with the, the uh, monomers and polymers with the different kinds of biological molecules. Okay. Uh, well, uh, amino acids and polypeptides are in the family of proteins. Um, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides are in the family of carbohydrates. Uh, DNA and RNA are both polynucleotides that are in the family of nucleic acids, right? And so there are three of the four classes of biological molecules that you really need to know about for any biology class that you take. Um, and the fourth class are the lipids. And at least some lipids are also going to be on the basis of monomers. In fact, um, let's take this molecule right here. In fact, this molecule on the right. 
we call it a fatty acid. Okay. And you can see that it's a, that's a good name. It's an acid because of this big old carboxyl group that's on the left-hand side, right? Carboxyl group is what determines its entity as a, uh, its um, identity as uh, an organic acid. The rest of the molecule out here is all kind of greasy because it's a hydrocarbon. And you know that things that are hydrocarbony tend to be greasy or oily or fatty, right? And so, um, yeah, it's called a fatty acid because it's a, an acidic breakdown product when you take apart, when you dismantle fats. If you take a fat, you uh, hydrolyze it, you, you end up with fatty acids. Okay, completely trivial aside, but basically, uh, if, I don't know if anybody has ever had the experience of making soap, okay? Soap making involves taking some type of, of, of grease, of, of fat, like, um, like coconut oil or tallow, which is beef fat. You can take any natural existing fat and hydrolyze it using lye, like hydrogen peroxide, yeah, hyd yeah, sodium hydroxide, right? And if you do that, what happens is that this, uh, the, the bonds break and you end up with these fatty acid byproducts and, and fatty acids is effectively soap. Soap is what you end up with if you just have a big lump of fatty acids. Um, right? Now, glycerol is, as you can see, it's, it's got this uh, OH group, which, which makes it a high, um, an alcohol. Glycerol is kind of like a triple alcohol. Okay? And each one of these OH groups on the side, this, this thing over here, is going to be a place where we can make a covalent bond uh, with a dehydration synthesis reaction. So let me erase everything that I've drawn here so far. Right. And now you can see the, uh, the dehydration synthesis reaction where this, oops, uh, where this bond in the fatty acid is broken and this bond in the glycerol is broken. Get rid of those. And we'll take uh, that extra hydrogen that I just erased, put it onto the oxygen over here. That's going to be a water molecule. That's, that's going to be leaving, hence dehydration. And synthesis, because we're putting together the fatty acid with the uh, glycerol. And, and, and so the, the idea here is that if you put one fatty acid, fatty acid number one, over here, you could put fatty acid number two onto the second position and the third fatty acid onto the uh, third position on the glycerol, and then you would have a tri, right? Three glyceride, uh, this would be a three fatty acid glyceride, and that's gonna be the foundation of uh, fats and oils. The tallow beef fat is based on triglycerides, it's different triglycerides compared to Coconut oil. Uh, coconut oil is, is is different because of different uh, because the fatty acids that are there are going to be different. You could have some fatty acids with double bonds. You could have some fatty acids that are longer, shorter. There's a, a large variety of different kinds of fatty acids, and the main difference between coconut oil and safflower oil and peanut oil and uh, chicken fat and fish fat and beef fat are all in the composition of the fatty acids that are there in the triglycerides. Okay. But triglycerides generally is a class that we identify as fats and oils. Okay. okay, so let me go back to our um, outline here. We talked about everything up here early in the lecture. Dehydration synthesis, the mechanism, hydrolysis, the mechanism of catabolism, endergonic and exergonic monosaccharides to polysaccharides belonging to the class of carbohydrates amino acids, polymerizing to form polypeptides in the family of proteins, mononucleotide triphosphates are pre-charged with their, um, extra, those extra couple of phosphate groups are giving it that extra energy that allows them to uh, make polynucleotides without outside energy source, but it's still a polymerization. 
quick example of a catabolic reaction. And uh, when, when it comes to lipids, at least some lipids like triglycerides can also be thought of as taking part in those processes of dehydration synthesis and uh, hydrolysis as they're put together and broken apart. And that brings me to the end of the lecture. Okay. So uh, this there was, I know there was only one bit of reading here. It's a little bit heavy. The, uh, the textbook author decided to put in um, a little video to summarize everything. Um, this whole video is kind of like a very long version of what the, uh, the brief video in the textbook did, but it, but it deserves a little bit of repetition because repetition sometimes uh, the best way to learn stuff. Okay, I will see you with the next unit.